How's it going, Publius? Quite well, man. How are you? I'm doing very well here. Okay, there are a few things um, or questions maybe that are already dropped uh, in the time of chat, but we can um, start maybe with some of the discussion that has been going in the questions channel and maybe a few other channels as well in our in our Discord. Um, starting off with um, um, an idea or a question uh, uh, that we maybe have discussed before, but we can revisit uh, and touch uh, upon it. Um, and I think Breezy maybe actually took screenshots of that, is it? No, so maybe that's another question. All right, so we start with the first one, and that's from Syncubate, uh, where he recommends, um, uh, and as I said, again, uh, that was you know suggested uh, earlier, and that is, uh, what if we, uh, in order to reduce the, the pod line, um, we, you know, uh, pod holders can exchange it for stock, basically. And then what? I think that's it. So the thinking there is that let's reduce the, the pod rate. So we'll offer those who have pods to exchange it for stock or equity. Uh, and that way, you know, the, the, the protocol has less debt. There are no beans attached to it? Sure. I'm not sure what uh, their thought was, but let's say that you only get stock and no beans attached to it. Yeah, in general, things like that are something that we would not think makes much sense. One of the key design principles of the silo is that the only way to acquire their stock and seeds is to retain bean exposure. And the idea of issuing some sort of stock and seeds that exist in perpetuity with no requirement to hold bean exposure does not seem to be in the interest of bean stock. Okay. I, I wanted to maybe take, take, a, take this thought experiment a step forward. So right now with, let's say, you know, whatever the pod line um, um, is, um, there is a mecha mechanism to continue, you know, to give an incentive, let's say, uh, to to sell to sell soil, uh, and that's the temperature. So the temperature keeps increasing until you know you reach that demand. Uh, if we move, you know, all of that pod into stock, uh, what happens uh, to the silo uh, or you know the 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 other side of it? Does it get too concentrated, and then what do you do there, or what do you do then? I mean, to some extent, just disagree with the premise of the question because. In an efficient market, and Beanstalk is far from an efficient market, you'd expect the return in the pod line or the implied return in the pod line to, to be efficient relative to the implied return for holding a given asset in the silo or a given deposit in the silo. Uh, if you assume that there is some sort of Ex, like like the the implications are derived from some curve on the assumption around bean mints per time. So, so the market will have to come to some sort of assumed price around be, expected bean mints over time, and everything is a is a function of that price effectively or that curve. We should say um, that's that's separate from the the notion that. That, that you should be able to exchange pods directly for stock, you can always exchange pods for beans. And then by having beans, you can acquire stock. So to some extent, that already exists, uh, but not in the way that you can, at the system level, destroy pods for stock, uh, which would be uh, just in practice, destroying a fixed return for a, a perpetual infinite return. And that would make the whole notion of lending to Beanstalk something fundamentally different than, than what it is currently. Okay, and uh, I don't think Sync is with us. However, if um, you know, they listen to this recording and they, have, you know, they wanna further expand on their idea, please feel free to do so. Okay, Publis, I'm going to move to another um, discussion or topic. Uh, and this is going to be more, I guess, of a conversation here now. Um, Safi in the Beanstalk Ideas um, channel uh, started a thread, and the thread says a disaster response plan, you know, for a potential USDT DPEG. Uh, and and they're thinking they're say they're saying that you know they're not proposing that uh, the DAO takes action, but their their proposal is that for the DAO to be prepared if something happens. 
uh, and maybe it's it's a long it's a long thread, and I may not uh, summarize it well. But I think the two key points there, you know, for us to think about maybe are two things. One, what is the response um, that is you know maybe the DAO will want to prepare for it and have it prepared so that we can take that uh, action quickly instead of you know waiting for the event to happen and then start thinking of what to do. And then number two is when would that you know uh, trigger uh, be happen or if we have a plan, when would that plan be triggered? Well, I think the real difficulty is around defining a trigger because the risk to Beanstalk is likely to be uh, realized in a very short period of time. Uh, The market would tend to very quickly start to price uh, a tether DPEG, let's call it, uh, as, as unlikely as we personally think it is. Uh, just considering it, it, it for what it is, uh, if 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 it were to happen, it's likely to happen very quickly, and therefore the question is the BCM, which is the owner of Beanstalk and would be the 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 multi sig that could act swiftly, would need, as you said, mod both uh, a, a a plan of action and if anything uh, everything done in advance uh, to be able to just a transaction uh, and two very clear parameters by which they would be authorized in order to do so. Uh, so in short, uh, you know the I mean maybe it's worth talking about talking about each of those uh, specifically uh, if you think that would be good. I think we can spend some more time. why not? So with regards to the trigger, this is maybe the more difficult issue, which is, you know, there's always tether FUD. And so it's very hard to know what would be credible news uh, or what would be a data point or a series of data points uh, that if met or some combination of them were met w- would would justify the move. Maybe it's the tether price depegging to 95 cents but if we look at the structure of the three curve pool, if USDT is already at 95 cents, not sure how much value Beanstalk will be able to get for redeeming it. Uh, and it's worth, I mean, it's worth actually doing some sort of statistical analysis on the current liquidity in the three curve pool, uh, the current liquidity in Beanstalk that's exposed to three curve, and what, what, what would be able to be able in terms of liquidity that would be accessible uh, at given prices of a DPEG, uh, perhaps that would be the best way to determine what might be realistic metrics to to, to try to use. Uh, in terms of a plan of action, uh, this is something that, has, that the DAO has had at least one, one call on, but has discussed many times. And at this point in time, feel like, uh, it is probably, you know, it makes sense to put into place a plan that requires the minimal amount of development effort, uh, given both the probability that that this is necessary to go into action and the marginal relative improvement relative to the dev cost for each additional solution. Uh, so, so to be frank, you know, the, the minimal solution of using the frax base pool, uh, uh, and having that trade against beans, that's it's pretty heinous. Uh, it's not Frax is highly centralized. It's a layer of centralization that is way less trustworthy than USDC or even Tether from our perspective. Tether is way more of a reputation and, and, and stuff on the line than the Frax multi-sig. So to be frank, it's not uh, don't view it view it as a an attractive option in general, and should be something that's that's uh, only done in the most exigent of circumstances. But it it is possible to move the the bean liquidity to the frax base pool with with very minimal development effort. Uh, now, any any other type of pool would require real upgrades to the silo and. Therefore, it's it's less likely to be something that could be implemented, uh, in in the very short term. Uh, but feel like this is such an 
a, a, a constant thing that's been raised by the community. It is, you know, it shout out to Safi for taking the time to write up uh, kind of the current state of the problem. And hopefully this is somewhat constructive and therefore people can continue to discuss what, what, what should actually be done. And maybe can, someone can actually go do this analysis. Again, this is not something that we view as particularly pertinent uh, such that we are going to spend time on it ourselves, but more than happy to continue to be a part of the conversation and try to move this ball forward. Okay. And you do raise a good point. Maybe the price is not the trigger. It's more of the liquidity that's available uh, in the pool, just given that the price is always manipulated by the amplification factor um, um, of the pool. Publius, from a, a development uh, perspective, um, let's say you know we hit that emergency and whatever trigger that we decide is a trigger and we decide that let's let's do it. Um, is uh, is the BCM able to immediately exchange the liquidity without impacting you know the user balances and stock and and so on? Is that something that could be done? So we pause being stock, exchange that liquidity, and then we'll sort out everything to bring it back, you know, and and then resume. So the short answer is that's one way to do it where the protocol could be paused. Uh, the liquidity, the LP tokens underneath the deposits, which are owned by Beanstalk, could all be redeemed uh, for, for three curve and bean. And the three curve could then be redeemed for USDC uh, and or die. And at that point, you know, the question is what to do with the liquidity. Now, it's possible to have a a frax based pool, bean pool, not sure on the exact terminology, so apologies if we're misspeaking, but the frax BP, I think it's called, uh, bean pool, uh, that could be deployed at any time or be ready to be deployed. And at that point, the liquidity could be added to the pool uh, using beans and whatever, uh, uh, Frax baseball could be minted using the USDC that was received. Uh, now, right, I should say redeemed is probably a better word. Now, in terms of the distribution of the deposits or the LP tokens to the deposits, there's an open question as to whether the LP tokens themselves should just be replaced pro rata or whether there's some additional la like layer of sophistication around fair treatment, but would think probably just a pro rata swap, assuming Beanstalk had X LP tokens and now has Y LP tokens, everyone should just get uh, should get Y over X LP tokens. So that's times whatever they had before. Uh, so that's I think that would be the simplest thing. Uh, it would still require uh, some sort of update to Beanstalk itself, uh, but perhaps all of the code that would be needed, like the script itself that would update Beanstalk, even that could be done in advance and even audited by Halborn, uh, such that if the trigger were met, the downtime of Beanstalk could be, could be truly minimized. And okay. I think to some extent, you know, if this type of plan were put in place, it does become a repeatable thing where let's say there's a problem with FRAX uh, or with USDC, which would also be a problem with FRAX, uh, the same thing could apply. But in that case, there really wouldn't be a backup plan to redeploy liquidity easily or quickly. But nonetheless, maybe it's good to have some sort of parameters that are defined through which the BCM can remove liquidity, uh, which at some point could be codified on chain and through wells at some point, certain things like that may implicitly exist, but otherwise, uh, y you know, for now, for now, we're certainly stuck with, with the, the, the need for manual action or multi-sig action, whatever you want to call it. And don't feel like we should shy away from, from using, using that to its advantage. But again, the real question is what is the marginal development cost here? And, and so, uh, trying to, trying to just take everything at, at in in that light. Okay, and and for the sake of the discussion, um, uh, as we as we're discussing it, um, 
it, it doesn't also have to be a swap for a stable. You can swap for ETH and then maybe relaunch once you figure out, you know, the pricing uh, or the Oracle for uh, for ETH. And, and, me, and as you said, it could be done um, ahead of time that we minimize um, the impact or the downtime of the protocol, but that is not necessarily, um, let's say, required. It is possible that, you know, we pause the protocol, we swap, and then take our time to restart. Uh, is that correct in theory? Yeah. Okay, so I think maybe to our, our listeners and 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 this is to the to the DAO in general that you know security and and whatever direction Beanstalk takes is is the you know responsibility of everyone uh, um, in the DAO. I see no harm in uh, having such a plan planned. Let's say even if you know members or some people think it's unlikely, uh, and then you know if if it happens or it gets you know triggered, uh, there is there are ways. Um, Again, as as we said in theory, for for the for the DAO to take to take action. Okay, um, Tyler B asks: the demand for beans are right now inexistent. Does that mean products launched on top of Beanstalk, Root, and OnMBB are not bringing any liquidity? Any ideas on how to increase demand for beans? Usage of beans in other DeFi protocols can be a start. Uh, totally, totally disagree. Just saw on the bots. A thousand uh, twenty-two beans bought for a thousand USDT that, that were then used to mint a thousand eighteen roots that were then bet on Georgia. So that to, to to beat LSU in the SEC championship game, that's organic demand. That's what we should all be looking for more of. Uh, no real thoughts on own a bean at the moment. Per our conversation last time about audits, it's very hard to to talk about what we'd, what we'd like or expect from an, uh, you know, something like that that's just been thrown out there. I mean, uh, frankly, haven't, haven't been following it too much either, uh, so, don't have, don't have, so don't have much data on how that's doing or generating demand. But the idea that the stuff that is actually creating utility, like root, and then the, the real utility comes from the parimutuel betting markets, uh, that that's not creating demand, totally disagree. Totally disagree. Now, it may not be creating millions of dollars of demand, uh, but that's a that's a separate that's a separate uh, the magnitude is a separate question than is it creating demand and really don't don't want to understate the fact that 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 type of demand to to buy beans and then bet using the roots that you minted with the beans that you bought that that's. Uh, this is the first time there's been any sort of real utility for beans. And the first time you've had any demand for beans that isn't speculative. So I feel like it's very cool. And uh, yeah, it's not a, I mean, to be frank, the UX isn't at a point where you'd expect people to be betting hundreds of thousands of dollars. The, the liquidity isn't there yet and liquidity begets more liquidity, but I feel like this is a very exciting start. Agreed. And you, you've touched upon that, I think, in the last class, uh, Publius, when you said, uh, you know, there are two types of demand, uh, speculative and then transactional. And what we're seeing right now with Root is transaction, um, you know, maybe for the first time, but not really for the first time, there were other transaction users of Bean at a smaller scale, but now we're seeing more transactional, you know, users uh, for Beans that are not just purely speculative. Um, and the other, the other bit, as you said, as well, is the magnitude. So the, maybe the size of root that's recently just launched is still small in comparison, you know, to 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 the size of Beanstalk the protocol. But that may change, and as more more protocols get get built and are also you know using using Beans. Okay, I'm going to stop for a minute there and see if uh, our audience have any questions before I I go to the next topic. Okay, so Publius Beanstalk Farms today um, released or announced uh, a video, an explainer video. Uh, and in that video, it explained, um, you know, interest rates uh, and the idea of, you know, that collateral is an inhibitor uh, to scalability or growth uh, uh, for DeFi. Um, there, there has been some discussion on on Twitter, uh, and then one of the questions or one of the um, highlights, and that was from ASFI, where they said that the current interest rate for USDC, for example, on Aave, um, is lower uh, than, you know, the, the federal fund rate or the funding rate that you would get off chain. Um, can you maybe explain why is it right now that the interest rate on USDC, for example, lower uh, than you know what you would get on uh, off chain? Let's say. Well, 
there's a couple things. One, the demand for stable coins seems to be a derivative of other forms of yield that you can receive or return that you can receive on chain. And at the moment, that's because most of these, these collateralized stable coins, uh, particularly USDC, USDT, they don't have native yield to them. And so the demand for them comes from, uh, and, and the demand for them that manifests itself in high borrowing costs comes from the opportunity cost of what else you can do with them. And it's a little bit of a catch-22. But the point is that right now, there's nothing that is creating, uh, I guess you could say with the exception of Beanstalk, but people don't seem to be very interested at the moment. Uh, there's no real yield on chain. And there, there's also no uh, token go up momentum at the moment, which means that people aren't even looking to borrow stable coins for directional leverage. And when you combine that with a rising interest rate environment, uh, it, it kind of all becomes compounding and reflexive. So the result is that the, the things that you can do with your stable coins on chain are very, or, or would want to do with your stable coins on chain, I should say, are very limited. Uh, but more than that, the, the, the opportunity cost of the risk-free rate of just holding T-bills is now, is now making it sort of prohibitive to, to, to hold the stable coins on chain, but you have, you have all the supply. And so it seems like supply is exceeding demand right now. And you're having redemptions and decreases in the supply of stable coins, but uh, it, that's that's really a result of the the non-competitive interest rates. Uh, and again, the non-competitive interest rates are a result of non-competitive yield existing on chain that people would want to borrow stable coins to access. So a little bit of a catch twenty two here, as we said, but that's that's how economic systems typically work. Things are all related. Yeah, I think the, the question also missed uh, the, the point of the, the interest rate, which is the opportunity cost. So um, you would expect uh, UCC holders that if they're not getting the interest rate that they can get off chain for them to redeem it to real actual dollars and then deposit it in some, in some bank. So the question is, why aren't they doing this? But what doesn't change is that there is an opportunity cost that you know they're, they're, they are losing that, let's say, or someone is paying uh, um, for it. Why are people still holding USDC and not exchanging it? That could be for multiple reasons. One of that is that it takes time maybe for people or for you know use, uh, participants, users, whatever they are, to react. Uh, or otherwise is that you know they want to stay on-chain and it was, it, it, there is an inefficiency in keep on, in going off-chain, on-chain, off-chain, on-chain, on it. But it doesn't change the fact that there is still an opportunity cost here lost between you know having it off-chain with a lower interest rate versus what you would get um, um, off-chain. All right. Um, we are at, at the end of the uh, town hall questions here. Let's let's give it uh, some time or a few minutes and see if others um, have questions, whether it's something that we discussed or something that we haven't, um, and, and we, we can start it or start the discussion. I mean, maybe just to, to, to expand on that a little bit more, if, if there's no questions for a second, is from an interest rate theory perspective, the, the interest rate can really be thought of as like all prices being derived from supply and demand. And the people that have the currency, they're the supply, they're the people that are lending it. To them, you know, they, they, there's, there's some, some benefit to just holding the currency itself, in theory. And so the, the, the floor of the interest rate on a given asset can be thought of as the the marginal benefit to the holder of that asset of simply holding that asset for the period of time that it's lent out. And if you think about USDC or USDT in particular, they're not the greatest assets to hold, right? They're not, when you think about, ooh, I wanna hold large amounts of this thing uh, for a period of time, USDC doesn't really come to mind. USDT doesn't come to mind. 
And therefore the, the supply of uh, coins that can be lent is likely to be a very high percentage of the total supply of coins and is also likely to approach zero in periods of time where there's no demand for borrowing money. And so the other, the other side of the equation where the price of interest is derived is, again, from a theoretical perspective, is the, the demand to borrow money. And what, what you'd expect that to come from is, at least if, if, if there were a real crypto economy, you'd expect that to be the, 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 the maximum cost that entrepreneurs could, could pay where they could reasonably expect to, to make a profit when you consider their borrowing cost or make a profit at a certain uh, margin or rate or amount that they view the whole venture as profitable. And in short, there's not a lot of A, entrepreneurial activity happening on chain right now, where there's lots of great stuff to, to, to invest in or participate in or use capital for, or as we started this, talking about just yield opportunities, which is what stable coins have typically been used for. Um, and therefore, there's not a lot of demand for stable coins at all. So, so separate from the actual supply of the stable coins, which is a lot, just the, in terms of the, the borrowing and lending activity, there's not a lot of demand to borrow stable coins right now. And of the supply that exists, there's a high willingness to lend stable coins at low interest rate because of the nature of the assets themselves. So structurally, don't feel like the, this, this has anything to do with the, the concept that, and this is maybe the point to answer about Aspie's point on Twitter, which is does the, one, of these, one of the core theses of Beanstalk, which is that the borrowing costs on chain are non-competitive, that that's one of the things holding back crypto. Does the fact that we're in this period of time where there's, there's lower on-chain borrowing costs uh, than off-chain, does that, does that mean that that thesis is wrong? Uh, to some extent, that's a very reasonable uh, interpretation of the data, uh, and it has to be considered. Uh, from our perspective, that data is more reasonably interpreted as DeFi is still very much in a catch-22 situation where there's almost no utility for DeFi. There's nothing that you can actually do in DeFi that is that we would classify as real economic activity or, or very little. And therefore, uh, the concept that there's, there's a lot of things that you'd expect there to be organic demand to borrow stable coins to do doesn't, doesn't really follow. And, and so in practice, the situation that DeFi is in, because there's not a lot of things to do with stable coins, uh, or to do in general is that there's no demand right now because there's nothing to speculate on. But from our perspective, that's that's part of the problem. But but the other part of the problem, and it is a catch twenty two, is that you can't even really start to build protocols or use cases that are used without a currency that is uh, is usable. And in short, uh, whereas we perhaps naively thought that just working on the currency would be enough. To, to ask his point, it's become clear that there isn't a lot going on in DeFi that actually facilitates real economic activity. And so one of the things that we're constantly asking ourselves is what does, what does the road to real economic activity look like? And this is a little bit of a tangent, but uh, the, the concept is, if you think about what businesses are, are doing and if businesses want to compete, businesses that are building on trustless primitives want to compete with businesses building on trusted primitives, at the end of the day, the access to financial products that they have needs to be highly competitive. And financial products are not just a currency, uh, it's also a whole suite of, uh, 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 I guess you'd want to say, access to liquidity of customized exposure or derivatives or products such that businesses can get the tailored exposure that they need call it treasury management 
uh, call it risk management, uh, call it hedging, whatever you want. This is a huge part of how all of finance currently exists and all, all of the economy exists. It's that businesses want to hedge certain exposure and financial markets really serve that role. And to be frank, current DeFi markets suck. Uh, AMMs suck. They don't rival centralized exchanges. The experience of trading on decentralized exchanges simply does not rival the experience of uh, centralized ones. Uh, perhaps you can make the argument that with borrowing, there's some significant advantages to DeFi borrowing over CeFi borrowing. But at the end of the day, most of lending and borrowing is still happening through CeFi. Why is that? Uh, these, are, these are really important questions to be thinking about. And so to be frank, there's a lot of work to be done to develop not just Beanstalk as a currency uh, or an issuer of currency, but DeFi in general to support real economic activity. And betting is cool. And what we were talking about earlier in classes, it's really cool that people are buying beans to bet, bet with them. That's really awesome. Uh, it is awesome. But betting is, I mean, maybe, maybe you can make an, a, a, an argument that betting is a, is a massive, massive part of the economy, and to some extent it is, but it, that's, not, that's not real economic activity. It's creating stuff. So maybe you can think of the betting and the exchanges as creating the ability for these financial products to exist uh, or these, these, these businesses to then access a, a permissionless tech stack that allows for them to, to access things that are competitive with centralized trust, trusted permissioned alternatives. But that's, you know, this is a very, in order for the world to really switch to, to permissionless primitives, it's not just beanstalk. It's not just going to be a, a lending and borrowing protocol. It's not just going to be well, it's going to be the integration of all of these different protocols in such a way where the, 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 the suite of things that are created are not just uh, equivalent to C5, but significantly, significantly outperform C5 and outdo C5 in terms of efficiency, capabilities, what's, what's possible, and think it's all within reach and think that the the development community that is forming around Beanstalk is really amazing. And a lot of it's, a lot of it's well underway, uh, but it's not going to happen certainly overnight. And it's going to take a, a massive effort from lots of different parties. And we're excited to see people starting to raise their hand and companies starting to raise their hand and the cult starting to raise their hand. And we're, we're very grateful to be a part of it, but this is not, DeFi is not in a place where it can rival CeFi. And there's a reason why you see people using FTX and still using Binance. It's like, well, there's no alternative. So what are we going to do? We're going to try to build the alternatives. But right now they don't exist. And it's worth, it's worth it to be humble about the fact that it doesn't currently exist. And then, then the point is, well, you can ask questions about why it doesn't exist. But, uh, you know, that, that, may be, uh, that may be too much for now. For, 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 for this answer, uh, I mean. And I think one, uh, one key uh, point here as well is um, as DeFi, you know, scales, it needs the currency that, is, that can scale with it. Um, so, you know, as, as these things happen slowly, as you said, it's not where it is at the state that maybe, maybe it doesn't rival it in all things. Uh, because, again, not everyone has um, access, yeah, let's say, to, to, to these off-chain tools. Um, so to to the others, you know, the AMMs and all of all of the other things are, are already great and much better than the alternative. Uh, but generally speaking, uh, as you said, as these things improve, the one thing for sure that will be needed is is a currency that can scale with it. Okay, Publius, Bacchus um, comes back uh, or goes back to the to the discussion of you know um, USDT depegging. Um, maybe I can read the question. So they said. If we find that there is a viable solution to migrating our liquidity and that the risk of USDT depegging is significant enough to use development resources to implementing it in case of an emergency, would it make sense to just proactively migrate our liquidity? So A, 
at least to some extent, this is, this is up to the DAO. Uh, and, and it's a great point, Bacchus, that, well, if we're going this far, why not go all the way? Uh, to some extent, again, just to reiterate, at least on this end, don't intend to spend any, any resources on this. Not sure about Beanstalk Farms. This kind of goes back to one of the questions around uh, whether or not the DAO can, can propose things that then they authorize or require Beanstalk Farms or certain organizations to, to execute. But as of now, not sure that exists. So at least from our perspective, we, we reached out to Safi to ask her to, or, or them, excuse me, I, I don't know, don't know, uh, don't know, don't know Safi. Uh, but just going off the PFP, but ask them uh, to 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 review or to to propose or draft something that that would kind of get this conversation going, but do not have do not have any do not have any thoughts on who would get that done or how it would get done. But at least on this end, you know, more focused on participating in the conversation. And then hoping that someone would step up and, and get it done. And we're happy to, to, to help and have multiple conversations to help whoever's going to do that, do it. Uh, but on this end, you know, not going to do it and don't know, don't know who's going to do it at this point. So for now, it's just discussion. Yeah. And, and back is, you, you know, you said if the risk of UCD pegging is significant enough um, to do that. I, th I think the idea is that, um, or the point is that not everyone shares uh, that thought, but it doesn't mean, you know, that someone could be could be right. And we'll only find out, you know, in time. Um, nevertheless, as Publius said, uh, we continue to have the discussion. Um, at minimum, maybe it is just, you know, a good idea to have an emergency plan, even, you know, if it never gets, uh, uh, it's never used. Um, implementing something of a change, let's say, you know, um, in such a short time, maybe um, uh, may come, you know, have negative effects, or it could be like reacting uh, uh, to panic. But the DAO, in the end of the day, is you know who, what chooses or who chooses uh, where, where we decide or where we where we move or where we go from there. All right, um, let's give it maybe one more minute. See if others have questions. Otherwise, we can we can end this class. Okay, thank you all for joining us this class. And Publius, as always, thank you for taking the time uh, to answer all these questions. And we'll see you all next week. Thanks, Mod.